Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final segment of the Ultimate Wedding Photography Summit. We have been going all day long, and I think we might be getting a little loopy, but we're uh, we're going to carry on. We've been going since uh, since about seven and a half hours ago, uh, and we've got uh, we maybe we saved the best for last. I don't know. We've got a fantastic last presentation for you guys. Um, our next focus, our final focus, is to move on to the subject of marketing. We're talking about marketing with love, marketing with love to your ideal clients. And we're joined by Justin and Mary Morantz. My name is Jared Bauman. I'm the president here at Shoot.it. I'm joined alongside me by Caitlin Cooper, who's our marketing coordinator. I'm going to be your host today, but I'll be turning it over to Justin and Mary in just a minute. Um, again, make sure to join us after the presentation because we're going to be doing a live Q&A with Justin and Mary, where Caitlin and myself are going to be asking all sorts of questions to, um, to, to, to really keep the uh, presentation uh, essentials going. We're going to be taking a lot of those questions and pulling them straight out of the uh, the chats. And so if you haven't, make sure to use the chat feature. Uh, if you've been here with us all day, man, you're probably tired of hearing us say that, but use that chat feature. It's located in the right-hand side of your screen. If you're on mobile, you might need to kind of pull it out. Uh, different mobile devices are different with they this. Work differently. Yeah, with this yeah. chat feature, but that's where you're going to be able to interact with everybody who's here, along with also uh, chatting your questions. And so we're going to be asking a lot of those towards the end um, after the presentation in a live Q&A. Um, Let's see. We also want to give recognition to uh, a bunch of companies, over a dozen companies who helped put this on today. Before I turn over to Caitlin to, to just give a lot of credit to a few of those specifically, just want to remind all of you, if you're if you're new to Shoot Diet, if you haven't been here all day and you're, you're just coming in, let me just tell you a little bit about us. We are the first choice post-processing partner for the Wedding Pro and everything they shoot. We make your images look consistent. We do that based on your style. Fast is best. No one is faster. That is especially relevant this time of year in the middle of August. Um, we provide turnaround time as fast as 48 hours. Um, so anyways, let me turn over to you, Caitlin, because there's we're coming up on the final uh, presentation here. And it's been such an amazing day. And it really, again, I mean, we've done over 60 online trainings as a company, but yeah. never have we gotten together such a big group of people and put on such a big presentation. It really couldn't have been done without the support of so many amazing companies. Yeah, I, I agree. We've, we've throughout the day, we've shared some amazing companies that have been a part of this. And, you know, I just have to say, it's been so great working with such wonderful companies and seeing the photography community really come together for this event. And, um, you know, definitely want to say last but not least, because these final companies that we have to talk about, they're, they're so wonderful within the community and we really couldn't have done it without their support. And, you know, we have, we have show it and show it. They are all about creating the website that you've been dreaming of with their platform. It's drag and drop and it's trusted by professional photographers. You can embrace your personal brand, set your business apart and turn visitors into paying clients without a single line of code. And we have Couture Book. Their mission at Couture Book is to create stunning, luxury, one-of-a-kind, handmade coffee table books with your photos. They combine old-world binding techniques coupled with the latest technology in printing and apply the highest standards of integrity, creativity, quality, and innovation to create the most beautiful books in the world. A little bit of background on Justin and Mary, and we'll get going. Uh, Justin and Mary Morantz are an internationally renowned wedding photography duo. They're named 15 of the most influential wedding photographers in the world by Profoto, one of today's supporters, mm -hmm. and one of the top wedding photographers in the country by Brand Smash. They travel the globe shooting weddings, teaching, and inspiring other small business owners. Uh, before I turn over to them, just one final reminder to, to be using that chat feature to chat in your questions. I'm going to be sending some of the questions to them via chat as they are presenting. I'll probably butt in with a few questions as well, but we'll really get the majority of your, um, we'll get the majority of your questions answered there, that live Q&A and really close out the day. So that'll be, uh, that'll be fun. But before we get to that point, I'm going to turn it over to Justin Mary and they are going to be bringing you 10 essential tips to marketing with love. Take it away, guys. So let's get started, you guys, with a little bit of marketing with love. Um, we named the webinar that um, because of this sort of idea that we have that when you have clients that you love and who love you in return, it's going to grow your business a whole lot faster than just booking anybody who comes to you. Uh, when Justin and I first started our business, that was pretty much the approach that we took was just book anybody who came to us because we thought, hey, we're just getting started. You have to book whatever you can, right? Um, but very early on in our business, one of the things that we've been very, very lucky um, to have happened to us is that we um, didn't seem very lucky at the time. We had the opportunity to book one client who was kind of, I think all of you listening probably have had a client like this, or if you haven't, you will. 
Um, the kind of client that makes you realize that you can't take every couple that comes to you because there are couples that will kind of suck out your soul, right? Um, and it was just sort of this really painful experience with this client and lucky for us that happened early enough that we kind of swore to ourselves we would never do it again. And so we started um, this kind of marketing strategy where we said, hey, we don't want to just book our calendar full. We want to book our calendar full with couples we actually like. Even better than that, couples we actually love. Um, the kind of couples who love us, care about us as people, and will actually kind of take up arms to fight alongside us in building this business with us. So I, we've put together in the next sort of hour 10 quick things that you can do starting right now that you can hit the ground running with. Um, to start book, not, not, not only booking more weddings, but booking more of those types of weddings. So before we kind of launch into those 10 very practical, you can go out and do them today, you can go out and do them this week, um, kind of tips that we put together, we have a few theories on marketing that we wanted to throw out there first. This slide that we're looking at, the way your clients find you, has become kind of a cornerstone of our business. Um, the rest of that sentence is, the way your clients find you is going to train them on how to think about you. I think that bears repeating. The way your clients find you is going to train them on how to think about you. When Justin and I were first getting started, um, I was in law school when we met. Justin went to school for photography, but advertising photography. And one day we just sort of decided that we would start a wedding photography business. And we said, great, we're wedding photographers. Now what? Right? What are we supposed to do? What is everybody else in our market doing to market themselves and build their businesses and book clients as wedding photographers. We looked around in our market in Connecticut at the time, 2006, and we saw basically two big things. The first was doing bridal shows, lots and lots of incredibly, I don't know what it is about Connecticut in particular, but we have some very cheesy bridal shows. Like, I don't know, just like if there were a movie about bridal shows, that's what happens in Connecticut. Um, and then the other was print ads. Um, very, very, very expensive print ads. And so the short version of that story is that our first full year of business, full time, we spent about $12,000 total doing three very, very cheesy bridal shows. Um, we kind of bought into the cheesy. We had a giant champagne glass filled with chocolates um, and fake rose petals and uh, the rest <laughs> in print ads. And here's the interesting part about that is that we booked some clients. We may, may have even, not really from the print ads, but from the bridal shows, we may have even made enough money back that covered it. And so it could be very tempting to call that a win, right? We covered our costs, maybe we even made a little bit of profit, and um, it seems like a win, right? Maybe those clients will lead to future bookings. But what we were finding is that the way your clients find you trains them on how to think about you. And so when our couples at the time were finding us as one of 25 photographers um, in the back of a magazine and print ads or one of 30 photographers lined up side by side by side at the bridal shows. They were being trained right from the beginning to think of us as one of many. Right? A photographer is a photographer is a photographer. Line them up side by side and find out who's the cheapest. And so a lot of our clients coming in at the time were treating us like we were nothing special. Right, we were just one of many, and photographers were meant to be compared um, apples to apples, who has the most bang for the least amount of buck. At the same time, when we were mostly putting all of our efforts that way, we had just a couple of clients come in, um, what we've now called our ideal clients turn friends. Three couples that first full-time year in 2006 who booked us because of word of mouth who booked us because somebody said to them, you guys have to find and hire, no matter what you have to do, and book Justin and Mary in particular. And those couples, not only did we love working with them, and we actually enjoyed going to shoot their wedding, those couples went out and fought for us over the next few years and each brought about 10 new bookings our way. So the first thing I kind of want to flip on your head when you're thinking when you're thinking about marketing is that it's not just about getting that booking. Um, a lot of people kind of get caught up in this idea. They say, well, you know, the bridal shows or the print ads or even the way that I'm marketing myself with word of mouth. It must be working because I'm getting booked. But what I want you to do is really start to wrap your head around the idea that the booking is not the win. I want you to think of each and every spot that you have in your calendar. Say you take 25 weddings in a year. I want you to start thinking about those 25 spots like golden tickets, right? You're Willy Wonka and you have golden tickets to give out to your most ideal clients. 
Because if you waste even one of those tickets on a bride who thinks of you as purely a transaction, as purely one of many, and who will never go out and say your name again, then it's like wasting all the weddings that that couple could turn into, right? The booking is not the win. Getting the bride who will go out and fight for you and bring you 10 more bookings over the next couple years, that's really the win. The seedless watermelon problem. What we mean by that is those brides that we were booking that first full year um, who were paying us good money, but were then kind of these uh, marketing dead ends, right? They would pay us the money, they would hand over the cash, we would hand over the DVD of images, transaction over, they wanted to walk away and never talk to us again. Those clients are what we've come to call seedless watermelons. When you're booking seedless watermelons and you're getting their um, payments, they're really ripe and really juicy, right? Uh, it's really sweet to get that kind of payment in. Um, but what do you have if you spend a whole year um, planting seedless watermelons? The next year, no new watermelons, right? And um, that harvest that you're trying to cultivate each year, keeps it never gets any easier. It's always that hard. It's not that they're talking. Um, I feel like word of mouth marketing is one of those sayings um, that people have said so much and we've talked about so much that people have kind of lost the real meaning behind word of mouth. When we're sitting down in a mentoring session with a photographer and I start talking about word of mouth, they almost universally will say to me, well, of course I have some word of mouth marketing going. I mean, I'm getting booked, right? But going back to our previous slide, the booking is not the win. And um, it could be that even if somebody found you from word of mouth, they are booking you by hearing the wrong things, right? So it's not that they're talking. It's what people are saying about you that really matters. Um, and so a couple of good things that go along with that. Um, let's imagine that one of your brides is going out and they're saying, oh, you should totally hire, um, I see Abby DeMond is on, right? You should totally hire Abby DeMond Photography, right? She's really, really cheap. Shh, stop talking, right? We don't want that bride being part of our word of mouth. Um, here, another one. Oh, you know, Erica Pope. You should totally, totally hire Erica Pope Photography. She was so patient when we did my 457 family combinations, right? Those are not things that we want to get hired for. Shh, stop talking. So it's not that they're talking, but what they're saying. And the way your clients find you is going to train, you, train them on how to think about you. So between those two ideas, we're going to start launching into a few of these 10 steps. Wrapping our head around that idea, the way your clients find you, train them on how to think about you. The booking is not the win. We want to book those ideal clients um, that are going to go out and rave about us and book us a lot more uh, weddings down the road. Here um, are a few tips that we've put together to start cultivating a word of mouth machine, kind of this uh, freight train of momentum that we talk about, that are going to actually get people talking about you and saying the kinds of things you want them to be saying. Here's number one. Number one is to take good care of the ideal clients that you already have. When a photographer comes in and sits on our couch um, in a workshop or in a mentoring session and they say, Oh, I don't know, my bookings have just totally fallen off. The first question that I always ask is, well, what have you done for the ideal clients that you've already booked this year, last year, maybe even the year before? What have you done for those guys lately, right? It's like Janet Jackson. What have you done for me lately? And so we um, will either recommend in those sessions or we do this ourselves. If we need to get a good influx of people talking about us again and saying the right things, we have a series of gifts that we do. I'm going to walk through a couple of the gifts that we do for our clients during the year that they're getting married, um, but don't feel like you have to be limited to this. If you're sitting here right now and you're in June of 2014 and 2015 is looking pretty empty, by all means, go backwards and send gifts to your brides for this year, your brides for last year, maybe even your brides for 2012. Um, when you're sending those gifts, a few things you should look for. Number one, Justin and I are big believers that those gifts should not be photo related. And what I mean by that is they can have photos in them, but don't give them a gift card to buy something from your business, right? Don't give them a t-shirt with your logo on it. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to send them gifts that are kind of mainstream and the kinds of things that you love and that you just want to share with your clients. So number one is not necessarily photo related. Number two is I want you to give them something that by its very nature is Instagrammable. Right? Um, it, by its very nature, it's Facebookable, right? It's the kind of thing people want to take a picture of themselves using or doing and share with their friends uh, in a social way. And so a couple of examples of things that we do is I'll let you talk about the blanket that we do um, at the holidays. So um, 
one of our gifts that we do during the holidays. We, we have two different sets that we'll do. Uh, one is for the clients that we've already shot their weddings in the past year, and then the other is for the upcoming clients that have already hired us, but we haven't photographed their wedding. And so the for the previous year, um, we get them a Williams Sonoma uh, bride and groom cookbook, and we ship that off to them. And it's just a nice little something that they can share together, and they can cook recipes, and hopefully, um, you know, share with their friends and family. And then the, the other gift that we do for our upcoming clients is a restoration hardware blanket, uh, which we actually have one hanging out right here. Uh, there you go. It's very fluffy. It's very soft. Uh, oh, nice. We enjoy it. And it's one of those things <laughs> that hopefully, you know, when they get this, they're, they're excited about it. They wrap up in it. They cuddle their dog on the couch, and they take some pictures and share that as well. And so what's great about both of those gifts is those two things that I talked about. Number one, um, they're not photo related, right? They're just stuff that we love. We love, for, we got that for a gift for our wedding, the Bride and Groom Cookbook from William Sonoma. And we loved that whole first year of making meals together, kind of building traditions of what, as a couple, we were going to make as kind of our regular nightly meals, right? And we learned that from that book. We can help our couples do the same. The other is this incredibly fluffy, fuzzy, amazing restoration hardware blanket. If you guys don't have this, seriously, wait till the holidays, they go on sale and buy one. Um, lucky for us, they actually happen to sell them in our color of teal blue, um, which is fantastic. And it's super fluffy, and we send it out um, with a card to our couples that says, tis the season to be cozy, right? And so as soon as we sent those out, we've done it for a couple of years, we always get this series of um, Instagrams or Facebook posts of them wrapping up, usually with their dogs. We are big dog people, so our couples tend to be as well. Um, and they're just... The, you know, it's the kind of thing that they can either cook with the cookbook and take a picture of the meal or wrap up in the blanket and take a picture of that. Um, and it's just very shareable. The third thing about both of those choices is that we kind of get to piggyback on the brand power and the brand value of two companies that we really like and respect, Restoration Hardware and William Sonoma. And we like our brand being associated with them. Your gift could be something local. Maybe you're really into the local coffee shop or the local um, ice cream shop would be even amazing, more amazing. Um, or, you know, we've seen people do, um, like, bread gift cards, like all sorts of dinner at your favorite restaurant. It doesn't have to be anything specific to what we do. But just sending these gifts as just kind of a, hey, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful you hired us. And I, I'd like to still, like, hang out with you and be friends even though the wedding's over. And I just want to touch base and see how you're doing. And so just even that little kind of thoughtful gift can really get people thinking about you again. Um, some good, you know, timing ideas. One of the reasons we pick the holidays is... Um, it's a super stressful time and we can be kind of a happy moment in the midst of that, sort of like we want to be on the wedding day. And it's also just a great time of year when a lot of their friends are probably getting engaged. So we think about that as well. Cool, let's go to number two. Number two says taking care of your vendors. Um, there are a few things that we can do um, to really kind of take care of our vendors. One of the questions that we get a lot from photographers is, you know, how do you kind of like reach out to a planner or reach out to a florist or a location if you haven't yet shot there without them feeling like you just want to schmooze up to them so they'll send you weddings. And I think the first and foremost answer is to make sure that that's um, as much as possible not your intention, right? It's definitely a part of it, let's be honest. But if you can kind of approach them first as a person um, and not a business, then you're going to get a lot further. So some of the favorite things that we've done for our vendors, um, keeping with that mentality of my favorite uh, definition of networking is, um, you know, what's the greatest good I can do for you without regard for what you can do for me, right? If you never do another thing for me, what's the best thing I can do to help you just because I like helping other businesses? So one of the things that planners are just pretty across the board in need of is it seems like nobody has a really great headshot to put on their website, right? Or behind the scenes of them working and setting up a wedding. Nobody has pictures of that. So volunteer, volunteer to go take headshots of them or follow, tag along with them at a wedding and show them in action. Um, or, you know, just uh, if you see that they're moving studios or something like that, volunteer to go carry boxes. Just volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Um, the second thing that we like to do, and I'll let Justin tag in, is what we call our vendor cards. And so for the vendor cards, basically we'll take one image from the wedding that we just worked with them at. Uh, one of our favorite images of the flowers for the florist or the cake for the baker. And we'll create a five by seven postcard with their featuring their image on the front, their logo on the front, and a, a postcard blank back on on the back side. So they're able to share that with their clients, uh, write notes, little things like that if they want. 
Uh, so from there, we'll order a pack of 25 of those cards from White House Custom Color, um, get those shipped out to them right away. And it's just a nice little thank you saying, you know, you did amazing work. It helped to make our pictures better. And we really appreciate working with you. And so um, a couple of things about those White House cards. Uh, the first is that we go ahead and spring for the pearl paper. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have gotten to check out the pearl paper from White House, but and I, I think there are some other labs that probably offer it to you, but we love White House. Um, and it's just a remarkable paper when you get it in. It's a thick cardstock. It's got this really pretty sheen to it. Um, to clarify a few different things Justin talked about, um, White House has a template for those postcards, so you can just download that and fill it in. Um, we go right on their website and sample their color to make that the border. We steal their logo off their website. Nobody has ever complained. Uh, we only need it to be like a little thumbnail kind of size, so that's always plenty big enough. And then we include a picture that we've taken from that wedding working together that just best shows off their work. On the back, we have their name, their website, and their contact information. Here's the key. We do not put our information on it, except in very small gray letter at the bottom, it says photo by Justin and Mary. No website, no logo, no contact information. By doing that, a couple things happen. The first is that it is now truly a gift just for gift's sake, so it doesn't feel icky or like there are strings attached, like we have to market ourselves together. The other is that because it's the pearl paper, because it's designed really pretty, it's almost always better than anything they had, and so they actually are happy about giving it out. And the third is that by leaving that logo off, not only are we kind of creating this goodwill by having good intentions, we're actually creating the opportunity for conversations about us. Right, so as that vendor is handing out that card with their information on it, um, they've written notes on it, they'll say something like, oh yeah, and if you're looking for a photographer, you should check these guys out. Oh wait, their website's not on there. Hold on, let me pull up their blog and show you a few things. And we've actually had a couple of florists and planners spend more time in their meetings going over our website and our work than their own. Um, and so it works out. It's a huge win all around. Great marketing for them, great marketing for us. The third and final thing that I would say with just um, reaching out to your vendors, creating a good um, relationship with them to get them talking, is consider hosting a few different kind of like networking nights, right? Um, if you're a girl, you could have a girls' night out where you go and get martinis or margaritas or um, try the new, um, what would you call Geronimo? Tex-Mex? Tex-Mex place, uh, where they make guacamole right at the table side, right? Like plan a like girls' night out or, you know, if you're a guy, whatever, plan a guy's night out, or you and a bunch of girls, which is probably how the wedding industry works right now. But plan a few, like make it your goal of once a month or once every other month, where you just host a mixer of, let's say, four or five people. You can change up the people each time. And what's cool is that you're now making yourself kind of the linchpin, the hub that's bringing those people together. So people will automatically see you as a leader, and they'll want to associate with you and your business a little more. All right, cool. Number three is leave a sample album. If there is one thing that you take from this presentation, seriously, like put three stars and like a unicorn in your notes, whatever you have to do to make sure you remember this one, leaving a sample album at a location has been an absolute game changer. It kind of seems like an old school thing to do, right? Because, you know, sometimes we'll go to the venues and we'll just see like um, much more established or let's say they've been in business 20 or 30 years photographers, like the very um, classic black albums. And so, um, we kind of learned from that, but we said, let's put our own spin on it. Let's figure out how we can kind of be the purple cow in the midst of all those black albums. And so what we'll do is we'll pick one or two or three locations where we've had the chance to shoot and we would love to shoot again, and we'll just go ahead and make a sample album for them. We do not get permission. Um, we do not pay to be on their list. Uh, we'll make the book, and when we're making it, we're looking to make it look different, right? So we'll pick a different color leather or different size. You know, look for something kind of funky like, um, is it uh, Madeira who has the really cool, or Fineo? Madeira and Fineo have those really cool, like, um, long, skinny, vertical books. Anyway, just pick something that makes it look very different, right? Like a couture book has the leather journal looking albums, whatever, just something that in a sea of 10 by 10 black leather albums, it'll be all the same and then, whoa, what's this, right? Because that's going to be the one people pick up. We left a 10 by 10, I'm really kind of ashamed to say this, maroon album, yikes, um, maroon album at our wedding venue about eight years ago now, 2006, eight years ago, and um, 
that, I mean, it was eight years ago. So, wow, like we've grown, I really hope we've grown so much in our work. And it was, a, I'm just going to say it again, it was a maroon album. Like, what were we thinking? Um, but that one book that we left at that location eight years ago, we calculated it up for a talk not too long ago, has brought us in just under $50,000 in bookings ever since, right? If you think about an average booking of, um, you know, a little while ago when we were getting started, maybe more like 4500 and then our bookings have gone up. Um, we're now like, we've, I mean, that was a $400 investment for a $50,000 return. Like, Wolf of Wall Street would be jealous of that kind of return, right? So um, leave that book, leave it at one or two or three locations. Um, if you can, make it a nice leather bound, $400 kind of book. If you don't have that kind of money to drop on even one location, let alone three, um, one of the people we just discovered is Artifact Uprising, and I'll let you talk about them really quick. Yeah, um, we actually haven't used them for a sample album just yet, but uh, we ordered a book from our vacation, just from Instagram photos, and really love the look of it. And it's, you know, it's remarkably simple, very easy to design, and I think, you know, if, if you're on a budget and you're looking for just a quick way to get a book at, at, at a venue, I would check them out for sure. Yeah. I think the one that we did was, yeah, it was like 8 by 8 25 pages for about $40. Don't quote me on that, but something like that. Yeah. Perfect. So, yeah, leaving a book at that location not only brought us in about $50,000 uh, in revenue, like I said, it also turned into, I'm going to say, eight, seven or eight different ideal clients who then became their own booking streams, right? So, 50,000 kind of in direct bookings of people who've hired us at that venue. And then from those couples, when you start adding in their friends and their friends' friends, um, it starts to become pretty astronomical what this one small investment did. This one seed that we planted, um, what a huge harvest it reaps over time. So I think it's kind of one of those things that we sort of maybe in the back of our heads know we should do, or maybe you're hearing this for the first time, um, but we don't actually get it done to make it happen. And so something like Artifact Uprising, I was able to design that book in about an hour and a half. So there's no excuse, $40, hour and a half, there's no excuse for not getting that done, right? You can do that this week. Okay, become allies with other photographers. Um, when we're having those workshops or mentoring sessions, one of the items that are always on the to-do list for photographers we're meeting with is to find about three or four other photographers um, that are maybe kind of in the same place. They don't have to necessarily be the same style. They don't even necessarily have to be right in your market, but just kind of in the same place of their business. A couple of years in, three or four years in, more established, whatever it is, just getting started. Find some people who are going through the same kinds of stuff that you are so that not only you can refer each other, um, but you can support each other when you get your first uh, stressful client or your first stressful lighting situation or whatever it is. And so here's how I would approach that. Um, I would first make a list of who you'd like to be your three or four, and um, then I would invite them out to lunch. And um, you're going to see between the, the mixers with the vendors and, and the taking these photographers out to lunch, we're big believers in picking up the tab. I think picking up the tab once can really just go a long way. And, uh, building a relationship with people. And so I would take those three to four photographers out and then, you know, have lunch, kind of give them an idea of what it is that you want to talk about. And then I would just get them sitting around that table and I would start saying, like, how are the bookings going? How's your season going? Get them talking about kind of the situation, the reality of where they are, and then just get them fired up. Say, you know what? I could do my best to get myself booked. You could do your best to get yourself booked. But all four of us working together to get all four of us booked, I bet could do it in about half or a quarter of the time. And so just get everybody fired up, say what your kind of, you know, your mission is. Like, what if we just made it, like, our goal together to make sure all four of us have our calendars booked out for 2015. And then what I'd love for you to do is start, one, a Facebook group, a, a private Facebook group where you guys can just go on and vent and uh, share ideas and set up times to shoot headshots for each other, whatever it is. Um, and two is a shared calendar, like Google Cal is, uh, Google Cal, is that what it's called? Google Calendar. I'm shortening things that don't get shortened. Um, and just kind of like this, anybody can access it, go on and see who's available for what date. And then um, when we refer a photographer, even if I had that group of three or four, I would still only try to pick one um, or two tops to refer off that list. Because when we refer other photographers, because we're quote unquote the competition, what we have the power to be is to actually become not just a referral, but a super referral for them. Because if the competition would say that they're really talented photographers and, um, you know, they, they, we should, you should definitely go check them out, then it's going to be the kind of referral that a client is going to take at face value. Because why, what reason would you have to lie, right? 
Um, and so I would really just go about making those photographers um, people you can lean on when it gets tough, when you're having those stressful days, when you have sat in front of your computer for way too long in yoga pants and a greasy bun, um, and get out and see each other face to face and have lunch and um, just get each other booked. Um, number five is going to be submit your work. And so I'm going to let Justin talk about Style Me Pretty, um, which has been this crazy, um, every single time we get featured on Style Me Pretty, we book a wedding at least, or two sometimes. Um, and then Two Bright Lights and uh, Black Star Ride. So I think uh, a really great way just to reach new clients is to have your work published. And so that can be in a magazine, in print, it could be on a blog, something like Style Me Pretty or Black Tie Bride. Um, but the idea is that we want to be able to get every one of our weddings published somewhere. And so the key to doing that, the, the number one uh, thing to do <laughs> is to make sure you're actually submitting them. It, it's really hard to say, I want to get something published, and then you're only sending in one or two weddings a year. And so um, if you, you, know, you want to find magazines or publications that fit the style of the wedding that you're shooting, also fit the way that you're shooting them, um, and be submitting only, only those weddings to particular magazines or blogs. Um, so, like Mary mentioned, we've uh, we've been submitting to Style Me Pretty for a number of years now. They've uh, been very great to us and featured a number of our weddings. And it's always great, you know, on our end to be able to see our work published and curated that way. It's great for the clients. It's validation for them to be able to say, "Hey, my photographers did a great job. It's good enough to get published." Uh, and then it's also great for you know future bookings and and new clients finding you. Um, another way that we submit is through Two Bright Lights. Um, we've been using them for a couple of years now. And it's really just a great uh, little hub for you to bring all of your images to for each wedding, all of, all of the best images from each wedding, um, and pick this, the particular publications that they will fit with. And so um, I definitely recommend uh, a membership on Two Bright Lights. I think it's a really great way um, just to, to be able to reach a whole bunch of different blogs, a whole bunch of different magazines, and get a lot of work featured. And then Mary and I have actually started this year um, two different wedding blogs. One's called The Black Tie Bride, mm -hmm. which Mary is the editor of, and one uh, that is The Well-Groomed Groom, and that's my uh, blog. In any case, uh, I, started, I started accepting submissions through Two Bright Lights, and so you know, if you have a wedding that features um, you know, a bride, a very sophisticated bride, classic weddings, beautiful uh, details, and great moments, Black Tie Bride's a great fit for it. Um, if you have a groom with great style, some interesting looks, some bow ties, some fun stuff, uh, definitely feel free to send them our way as well. We'll go to that next slide just for a quick look at Black Tie Bride and Well Groomed Groom. There they are. You can find them right there are the URLs, uh, www.theblacktiebride.com uh, and wellgroomedgroom.com. Good. Number six is the blog comment contest. Um, we started doing this very early in our business, maybe six or seven years ago, and it just like crazy took off and um, it's been really cool to see a lot of the other photographers who've come to our workshops um, or our classes also put it in practice and just have huge success with it and so basically the blog comment contest is this for every single engagement shoot and wedding that we post up uh, we are obviously going to send an email to the bride to say that they're featured on the blog that day and so if we're going to do all the work that goes into culling and curating and editing and pairing and writing meaningful things about our couples, we may as well go one more step forward and actually make it hit the most powerful audience as possible. Um, the blog comment contest is all about getting um, the, um, just, oh, sorry, oh, I got all distracted there. Um, the blog comment contest is all about taking these people, the friends and family, the coworkers, the Facebook friends of your couples and actually making sure that they end up on your landing pad, which is your site, your website. And so here's basically what we do. For every engagement shoot and wedding that we post up, we're going to send out an email to our couples and we're going to say, um, hey, just so you know, you're being featured on the blog today. Yay. Um, also, just wanted to let you know uh, about a little contest that we run. If you want, no pressure, but if you want, you can send the link out to your friends and family and just have them come over and leave a comment. They can either vote on a favorite or just say hi. Um, and if you get um, uh, 50 comments, you're going to get an 8 by 10. 75 comments, you're going to get a free 11 by 14. And if you get 100 comments or more, then you're going to get a gallery wrap. And everybody wants the gallery wrap. And so what our couples are doing is they are posting it on Facebook. They are 
emailing all their guests, all their friends and family. They're putting it on their wedding websites and they're putting it on Instagram and they're sending people over to our landing pad. Now, if you aren't somebody who blogs a ton, if you don't have a huge um, either blog following or you, you aren't really blogging consistently, you could just as easily do this on Facebook or Instagram, um, which seems to be where a lot of the younger brides are heading. Uh, the problem with either of those, though, just to keep in mind, is that they do fade away, right? The blog is the permanent one. And so what will happen is if a year from now somebody searches for Branford House Wedding and they pull up one of our posts, not only will they see those pictures um, because the SEO is there, but also they're going to see 150 comments of people just raving about these pictures. And so it's such great marketing over the long term as well. So the blog comment contest. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause there. We have some questions coming in, which is exciting. All right. Um, for submissions, would you recommend 100 layer cake? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think the key with any any publication is just to look through their blog or their magazine, study the images, study the style that they're going for, and make sure you're picking the weddings that fit that that publication. So hundred layer cake, absolutely, definitely go for it. Yeah. And then another one we have is any suggestions to move forward from being a second shooter. And so we actually have a really good. Um, experience of that, I guess, because Justin actually got his start, like I said, he went to RIT for advertising photography and on the side started assisting a wedding photographer named Tim Toll in Rochester, New York, um, and um, through that second shooting was able to eventually start his business. And so we, to this day, uh, 11, 12 years later, give such huge credit to Tim for the fact that we even have a business period because what Tim did was he took Justin under his wing and he kind of taught him weddings. Um, and then right away, as soon as he was booked for weddings, he would start sending them to Justin. Well, about a year in, I would say. Um, and so Justin not only got invaluable experience before he ever had to shoot a wedding on his own, um, but he also was able to find a mentor who um, wasn't just looking to pick up an associate photographer or have somebody come work for his business. There's nothing wrong with that if that's what the person you're second shooting for is looking for now. But my advice would be to start looking for photographers who just want somebody to come along. They love teaching. Um, you'll come carry bags for a day and they'll teach you a little bit about lighting or workflow or the timing of the day or shooting the families. Um, and that there's this kind of understanding and agreement from the beginning that A, you'll be able to use some of the images on your future website or portfolio. Um, that's not always the case. And so you'll just want to make sure you have that clarified um, first so that there's nothing awkward. And um, second is just that, you know, find people who not only are great photographers that you look up to, but who are also great teachers, because there's a big difference. So find people who are going to, that year you spend with them are going to teach you a lot as well. Yeah. Great. Um, we have one more question we'll take for now is, what percentage of your price per wedding do you spend on gifts, back, uh, gifts et cetera, back to those clients? I'll let you take that one. Yeah, so for Mary and I, we've actually set a budget for all of our clients. Um, for us, it's $600, um, and basically that covers all the gifts from the initial, e the initial, you know, uh, first meeting with them, um, the engagement shoot, get, grabbing lunch or grabbing dinner with them, um, the, the different gifts that we do throughout, and then the holiday gifts as well. Um, and so that's $600, and a lot of times we don't even go that far. I would say it's probably like in the four to $500 range, but that is covered right off the top, and we know that those are going to be that's going to be the money that we're spending to advertise, essentially. And so when you take the $10,000 or $12,000 we spend on print ads or bridal shows the first year, and you translate that into, I, I'm going to fuel my ideal clients with uh, you know, ways to talk about me and, and great experiences, um, I, I feel like that's going to go a lot further for you in your business. Now, don't take me the wrong way. $600 is a lot of money, and so we did not start with $600 <laughs> worth of gifts. We started with one gift. You know, find one thing that works really well for you that that relates to your business. You know, give that to them. You know, it could be ten dollars, it could be twenty-five dollars, it could be forty dollars, whatever it is. Just allocate a certain budget for it. You know, fuel your clients with great, great stories, and uh, the rest, you know, it'll grow from there. And hopefully, at at some point, you'll be able to uh, invest more into the gifts. Yeah, I think that's the super, and I'm glad you said that at the end. That's the super important part to hit is that you have to just start with wherever you are, right? We did not start with the 10 gifts that we have outlined throughout the year. We started with chocolates 
that I think were like Hershey's or something. I'm just going to be honest. Um, and we would put them in a box that we would actually spray paint in our driveway because we couldn't find any resources that would actually make chocolate brown boxes. And so we were like Krylon painting these boxes and shipping them out. And the, the lids would get stuck to the base and when they ripped it off, it would take off half the paint. So don't do that. Uh, DNLphoto.com uh, does great boxes. We've discovered them. And there are pl probably a lot of other resources. Um, but the point is between, you know, the chocolate um, in the giant champagne glass at our bridal shows and the fake rose petals and the spray painting boxes in the driveway, like never feel bad about where you are, right? Just start there. Start there and do whatever it is that you can do as one next step. And you'll be amazed at how fast you get to a couple years in, six gifts and rocking it out and a full, fully booked calendar, right? The best of gallery on Facebook. And I will say that this probably piece of advice worked a lot better before Facebook decided to get really cranky, um, which has made me very cranky. Uh, but I think it's still probably worth mentioning, so I'll just go ahead and put it out there. Um, the best of gallery on Facebook is essentially, um, right now, uh, as of today, do it this afternoon as soon as you get off um, this webinar, go and pick somewhere between 30 to 50 of your best images from all of your weddings ever. This year, last year, the year before, just your best of. You hopefully maybe have a best of gallery folder for like your website. You can pull from those if you want, add new ones. Put those on Facebook and then re-tag the people in them. So it's kind of like a little reminder you pop back up in their newsfeed of, hey, remember how awesome this picture was? And I took it and you're in it and your friends should know that. Now, like I said, Facebook has gotten cranky with what it's allowing to show up in people's news feeds, so it's probably not as effective as it used to be, but I think for the input that it would require of time and money, which is nothing, and effort, uh, it's worth it, because if you book one wedding from it, it's a huge return. Present your best portfolio. And so one of the things that we always do in mentoring sessions and in our on day two of our walkthrough wedding workshop is we sit down and we kind of go through each um, attendee's portfolio, their website, as if we were the um, their potential bride. So I intentionally don't look at them until we're in that moment, whether it's the mentoring session or the workshop. And we pull it up. Um, you know, I kind of close my eyes until it's there. And I ask them before it loads to tell me three words that they hope as their potential bride I would feel about their work and three words that they would hope I would feel about them. And then we kind of go through it. Um, this is the world that we live in. And this is the most important thing. Um, I can tell you about making sure you're presenting the best version of yourself to your clients. Um, when we're in those sessions, time after time after time, as we go to load the website, if I got like a dollar every time somebody told me this, I would just go ahead and retire. They will say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, my website needs updating. You should really go look at my blog. And that's great, but it's very unlikely that a potential client will not only make it to your blog, but will... Um, unless there's a wedding post at the very top, we'll actually be able to navigate through and actually go to the categories and scroll down to weddings and pick on that. Maybe some will, but it's re you're really taking a big risk that you're putting your best work forward without having some landing page for them to go to of, you know, j &M's favorite images of all time, basically. And so in that portfolio, in that gallery, on your website, or if you have a blog site like we do, just having a gallery section, those images should be a couple of things. The first is they should be things you actually ever want to shoot again. You would be amazed at the number of people who will come in and say, oh, all I get are family requests. I don't understand how to break out of that. I just want to shoot weddings exclusively. And then we load their website, and the Gerber baby is staring back at me, right? The cutest baby ever born, photographed in the cutest way ever photographed, is staring back at me, and they're wondering why they're getting family requests. All right, so show what you want to shoot. Um, the bridal party jumping in the air. If you never want to take that shot again, like me, don't post it, right? Um, the guys getting ready in a church basement where it looks like a church basement or a conference room, you can deliver those pictures to them, but consider every single image that you include in your portfolio as a giant billboard um, for what it is that you want to shoot. And there's a market out there for everything, so be very careful. Um, the other things, kind of some of the bigger mistakes that we see in people and what they include in their portfolio, um, do you want to tag in on a few? Oh, I'll do a couple and you'll, you'll, you'll tag in on a couple. Um, besides not showing what you want to shoot, um, we see a lot of people include um, either multiple images from the same wedding in a row if it's a best of gallery and not just that wedding in particular. And that can kind of run the risk of somebody thinking you've only shot a few weddings ever. Or they'll include a few shots that are almost exactly the same image paired together, like 
one where they're looking at each other and one where they're looking at the camera. What we always tell people is when you pair two images that are that close together, you're essentially saying to the world, neither of these images is remarkable. Here's the proof, right? They're almost exactly the same. Choose the best one and only show that one and it will make your work um, have so much more impact and value just by narrowing it down and showing less. Showing less is the next one. People always have way too many pictures in those galleries. Your bride, your potential bride, is probably going to make it through about 25 or 30 before she gets bored. So make sure your 25 to 30 absolute best are the ones on the front end. And then, um, I'm thinking here, I feel like I had one more and I forgot it. Um, oh yes, the biggest one, the biggest one is as your bride is going through those images, she is hoping to be able to imagine herself in them. And so if you post images where maybe you loved the couple but the picture itself is not flattering, or maybe the bride was beautiful but the angle that you shot her is not particularly flattering, the bride isn't going to know any of those warm, fuzzy emotions you have towards the couple or what was actually happening in the moment if the picture doesn't tell her. All she's going to see is a bride not looking particularly her most flattering self. And she's going to have the fear that you'll do the same thing to her. So post pictures where a bride looking at it would want to put herself in that image. Also to add to that, I would just make sure that your, your processing and your style is very consistent throughout. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to have uh, one image processed with crazy textures and overlays and then have the next one be super clean and then the next one be you know contrasty black and white because what's going to happen is a, a bride may attach herself to one of those images and say oh I really like this contrasty black and white but then she gets to the next one and says oh I really don't like all this this crazy layering yeah. and so just having a style that's fairly consistent throughout image to image um, will leave the brides you know with less confusion um, as they're looking through your portfolio yeah. And then the last thing that we really recommend for that, um, putting your best portfolio forward, is to take the time. If something's going to make it into your portfolio, I want you to consider it with the same kind of honor you would give it if you were going to hang it on a wall in a true gallery. And so if something's going to be one of your true portfolio images, take five seconds extra to go in and touch out that stop sign in the background, or those power lines, or that distracting element. This is what we call plus one-ing an image, right? The image is an A, how do we make it an A plus? Um, just by taking out a few things in the background or maybe um, cloning in some sky. I don't really know. I'm making that up. But just making that image really, really polished. Um, psychologically, the way that our brains work is when we look at an image, the less that it confuses us, the more we will be drawn to it and the more that we'll like it. So if we can remove, remove a few of those, that was very German, remove. <laughs> if we can remove a few of those distracting elements, it's just going to be a much more polished portfolio. And so the, that kind of goes back to that idea of what we were talking about with um, showing too much work in general. And so this slide says, uh, I want you to go in and just really like clean house on those galleries. Go in with a machete. Um, if we were sitting on a couch together, just you and me, and drinking coffee, and we were pulling up your gallery, and you were about to say, oh, well, this was from two years ago. My work's gotten a lot better since then. Or you should really go look at my blog. Then why is it still up there? as the kind of greeting to potential brides who don't know anything else about you, who are not necessarily going to give you the benefit of the doubt. They're just going to look at your gallery and say, what are you telling me? You're telling me that your work is still two years ago, right? And so just go in with a machete and just do a hack job. If you only show me 25 amazing images, I am going to want to book you more and want to pay more for you than if you show me 100 mediocre ones, right? So go in and clean house. Um, is to just really make sure that your brand is where it should be. You might have the most beautiful work. Um, Justin and I are finding ourselves in this position to be fully honest with you. Our brand, which we loved, 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 and have loved for about six years, we launched in 2008, and we have now outgrown it. And we're at a place in our business where um, the next thing that's holding us back from going to the next level is our brand. And we're working on it. So we've already started designing it. We're working with Brock and Dave at Infinite to do the blog. Jennifer Olmstead, who's phenomenal, um, is doing the website itself. And we are holding ourselves to these same standards as well, right? We are at a, a ceiling that we have to break through, um, and the next step is updating our brand. So whether that means you don't have a brand at all, or raise your hand if you're guilty, your friend did it, unless your friend is Jennifer Olmstead, <laughs> then we should talk about it. Um, not necessarily. Your friend might be amazing. But if your friend did it and it's not amazing, um, or maybe you had a great brand but you've just outgrown it, then I want you to go ahead and start making the steps to update it. Now, I said 10 things you can do this week to start uh, marketing your business and booking more weddings. And you cannot necessarily launch an entirely new brand in that time. But one thing that you can do is just give it kind of a band-aid in the meantime and a really, really 
stylish, sexy, can we say, um, beautiful Band-Aid at that. And so uh, there are a lot of options out there. One of those that we're going to talk about just because we love them, um, I don't make any money for telling you this, I always like to make that clear, is uh, Tonic. And we can go to that next slide. Tonic is um, Jennifer Olmsted and Jeff Shipley's baby. It's a bunch of uh, website templates, but template doesn't even seem like a fitting word. Just templates, or sorry, website genius, shall we say. Um, that's a bunch of different brands that would fit a bunch of different businesses um, so that you could swap in your images and really hit the ground running <clears throat> by the end of the week with a polished new look. Maybe you'll do the six month, one year, soul searching, you know, intense go through the desert kind of process to do your true brand. But in the meantime, what we've been telling all the people who've been sitting down with us is you don't have six months to wait. You don't have a year to wait. If your bookings are not where they need to be for this year or for next year, then we need to put a better foot forward for now and do that longer brand um, in the long haul. But for now, there needs to be a much better storefront for people to show up to. Good. So Tonic is great. Um, Sighthouse Design is great. There are a lot of great options out there. Um, but just get something really worthy of your work up there. Number eight is cultivate connection, trust, and scarcity. So this is a very broad topic. Um, that I'm just going to kind of give you the overarching view on. Um, it's basically our website strategy. Cultivate connection, trust, and scarcity are three things that we're looking to do when we're designing the pages and uh, what we write and what pictures we show. Um, so let's start with the first one, connection. Um, if you go through each of the pages of even our current website, which could use work, but will work for now, um, if you go through even those pages, you'll see a couple of things happening that connect us as people first, photographers second, to those potential brides coming over. Um, in the header, you'll see Justin and I spinning around the video, um, spinning around in a field, making out, making everybody uncomfortable, um, and then they kind of flash into pictures of us. There will almost always be um, a personal post, a picture post, a personal post. We like to couch our work with the personal side of things. If you go on a page called Stuff We Love, it's literally a random collection of Stuff We Love. Um, we were one of the first people to do this about six years ago. No, yeah, six years ago. Uh, we did it when we launched our website just because we wanted something different. And it turned into one of the biggest marketing um, tricks for us. Trick is, seems like a weird word. Marketing strategies for us. Because um, this whole random collection of stuff we love turns into these many potential targets of connection. So on our site, we have these large landing pads of connection, like our about page, our promo video, the big blog posts, and then the stuff we love um, and our social media strategy kind of turn into these little mini targets that fill in the gaps. So if a bride comes over and she really resonates with how we see love because of our promo video, and then also sees that we love the Giants and WVU football and Starbucks and Golden Retrievers and Mini Coopers um, and Rockin' Republic jeans, whatever, um, then it just kind of makes her start to feel like, wow, these people, like, we have so much in common. I feel like they would get us more than anybody else would get us. And so our website strategy on each of those like seven pages leading to the info page is connection, 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 connection. Going along with that, we don't just want to be um, likable people with a cute dog, you know, or who drink coffee or who have a nice house or what have you. Um, we also want to make sure that we're putting a lot of emphasis that we're going to do a really great job for them. That we're people first, but also photographers really importantly as well. And so we're cultivating that trust by having really quality work that we put out there, by doing posts about our why and what we stand for and how we um, study the art of photography. And then just simple things like making sure we have, you know, a Justin at Justin Moran's email versus an AOL um, or Gmail account. Um, making sure that we have the ability to take credit cards and um, checks that we that we have business accounts. They're not making it out to cash, right? All of these things that make us seem like we are a legitimate business who take what we do very, very seriously. So that's the trust side of things. And then finally, scarcity is the big one. So each of those pages is connection, 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 connection. And then they get to our info page where they're going to send us an inquiry. And we've done one very critical thing that creates, that cultivates for us this feeling of scarcity. On the info page, it says, just so you know, we don't take every wedding that comes to us. Only if we truly believe we will be the absolute best fit for you on your wedding day will we agree to be the ones there with you. Because honestly, we don't think you deserve anything less secretly, not written out. We don't think we deserve anything less either, any of us, amen. Um, 
based on that one client that I told you about in the beginning, right? None of us deserve to have this thing that we love suck dry um, because of clients who don't get it. And so we put it out there right before they even inquire that just because you inquire with us, just because you want to hire us doesn't mean we have to say yes. We took this approach, super important to note this, um, very early in our business. It wasn't this, hey, you got to a certain point and then you could. I truly believe that because we made this choice first, that's what got us to a certain point, right? So we put it out there that we don't take every wedding, that we're going to filter those weddings and only if we're a good fit. And so now what we've done is connection, 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 scarcity, or put another way, I love you, I love you, I love you. Wait, I might not be able to have you. Now I really want you. And so if you go on our info page when you get a chance, um, you can see the form they have to fill out. They have to say on a scale of 1 to 10 how excited they are to work with us. And then we have an open comment box with no character limit to tell us what they're looking for. And you'll be amazed at what people will tell you about themselves when they have no character limit and they can just talk, right? Tell us what you're looking for. Are you going to be a good ideal client for us or not? Um, first question is, uh, would you recommend advertising with Style Me Pretty if they have already published several of your weddings? Um, that's kind of a tough question for us only because we were in Connecticut and so one of the very first markets that they started um, introducing themselves to, they're based in Massachusetts, was Connecticut. So we've been involved with Style Me Pretty since right from the beginning, 06, 07. Um, and so we've always, uh, we got in with the Little Black Book back when it was 250 a year. Um, and it's steadily gone up and we've steadily paid more, um, in large part more because we just love those guys and uh, we feel loyal to them. Um, would I pay it right now if they'd already featured some of my work? I think that, you know, as a good strategy, just because Style Me Pretty more than any other blog we've submitted to turns into way more inquiries and bookings, I think that's fair to say, I probably would. But I want you to take a look at your business first and see if there are more important areas to invest in, like sending gifts to those clients or updating the brand or updating the, um, the website. Do you set a time limit to get the prize for the contest we do on the blog? Um, we've never really officially set the time limit. Uh, it either sort of just falls off naturally and they don't reach it um, or they get it right away. But I would say um, one thing I would clarify is that we are going to try to make sure that they get the gallery wrap no matter what. We just budget that every single couple is going to get the gallery wrap because we want them to win. We want them to feel good about it, right? That's going to be that positive affirmation that's going to make them talk about it more. So yeah, we definitely, um, we're not really too picky about that. We're also not too picky about multiple comments or sometimes um, Obama will comment on our blog. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that's not really him. Uh, we, don't, we aren't too picky about any of that. Any kind of engagement makes us happy. Good. Number nine is to meet on your own turf. Justin and I are huge, huge, huge proponents of this. I'm going to kind of intro it, and then I'll let you tag in a little bit. Um, when we were first getting started, back in those, what we kind of called those job interview days where we had those seedless watermelons, we were uh, getting in our car, packing up our albums, driving out to all four corners of Connecticut, hour and a half each way. And we were showing up at people's doorsteps um, with our bag. We kind of felt like the vacuum salesmen, right? Like we were going to dump dirt on their floor and like demonstrate our amazing vacuum that was going to revolutionize their lives. Um, we would sit at their tables and feel super awkward. We wouldn't even be offered a glass of water. We were by every means on their terms. Then we kind of graduated to meeting at coffee shops and there would always be crying babies and espresso machines wailing or it would smell like burnt coffee or um, be fluorescently lit, what have you. Um, and so one of the things also pretty early in our business that we did, say 2007-ish, you're like, I don't know, one of those years, <laughs> 2007, uh, was we started meeting in our home. And so just to be clear, you know, to clarify this and, and counter this objection right from the beginning, our home at the time was a two-bedroom apartment. We lived on the second floor. We had neighbors on the first and the third who were always coming home with their groceries right in the middle of a meeting. Um, even though like we live in a pretty nice area at the time, across the street we had some drug dealers and next to us we had some drug buyers and they would love to meet right in front of our house to do the exchange. Um, so that was really shady. And um, you know, it wasn't ideal. Like you wouldn't look at it and think, oh wow, you're gonna have such a beautiful studio there. But we've always adopted the philosophy of take a look at where you are and see what you can make work with it, right? Like start with what you got and build from there. And so we went and bought a gallon of chocolate brown paint. We found a desk that's actually still in our house right here, just out of frame, on the side of the road. 
we bought a Bob's Discount Furniture couch, and the big investment was $1,500 for a TV that probably sells for like $150 now, to be honest with you. And we put together a studio right in our living room. We hung some gallery wraps on the wall, and we started meeting clients right there in our space. And um, what we loved about it was that we could control all of the variables, um, which I'll let you talk about here in a second. But I will just say that sitting there in our two-bedroom apartment with neighbors above and neighbors below and, um, you know, transactions happening on the street, we've booked some of our biggest, most high-end clients, including an NFL quarterback who sat on our Bob's Discount Furniture couch um, and played uh, Mario Kart Wii with Justin. So I'll let you talk a little bit about the, the variables. Yeah, and so when you're setting up your studio, um, you know, we kind of adopted the the idea that we want it to be the three-dimensional version of our website. And so in our new home, uh, not not new anymore, and definitely not new in the sense of it was built in the 1880s, <laughs> but in our house, uh, we've painted the walls to, to match our website. We hang details that match um, the stuff we love. They come in, they're experiencing all these things through the different senses. So they're seeing it, they're seeing it as if it was a part of our website. Um, we're you know, doing room sprays that um, that give the effect that it's you know a warm and inviting place to be. Mm -hmm. We have food out on the table for them, uh, chocolate biscotti and strawberries and all sorts of delicious stuff. Um, we're offering them wine. We're offering them um, champagne or mimosas if it's a morning meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we have music playing that fits Mary and I and our brand. So whether it be you know somebody that I love like singer songwriter Matt Nathan Matt Nathanson something like that or uh, you know some country good old country music for Mary you know just things that connect them to us so we have control over all those variables whereas you know when we were meeting at that coffee shop we had control over none of them and so um, I feel like it just it builds a much stronger connection and we can also be a lot more comfortable you know we can sit back on our couch we can kick our feet up if we want we can go to the fridge and serve them whatever we want um, just it's a lot more control yeah. And so what Justin started talking about there leads really great into our next slide, which is this, that idea of confidence. Um, everything that Justin talked about with what does the room smell look, <laughs> smell like, what is it lit, how is it lit, how is it decorated, what are we serving them? Um, we also have found that when we're in our space and we serve the wine or mimosas or whatever and we take a sip first, they're much more likely to feel comfortable um, to eat some of the food and take a drink as well. Um, so all of that just kind of like creating the kind of creative, beautiful space that we want associated with our brand is huge. But even bigger than that is the confidence factor. Uh, when we were going and meeting in their space, it was completely their turf. They had all the upper hand, right? And they, um, I think, could feel free to negotiate as much as they wanted. When we were meeting on neutral ground, but still a place we couldn't control, we still felt like we had to take responsibility if the baby was crying or the espresso machine was loud or it's not like burnt coffee. And so meeting on our own space, when they walk in, I, we are in complete control. Like Justin said, we can kick back in the chair. We can have a posture that seems very confident, very relaxed, very, hey, you're just coming to hang out. We're just going to get to know each other, and we're going to see if this is a good fit. And so that brings me to this slide on desperation, ideal clients, and the reverse sell. Um, I'm a big believer that um, business is a lot like dating. And so if you think about, you know, the first date or like every first date scene in every movie ever made, right, we think about the person who comes off a little too desperate, right? Like um, the girl who starts talking about getting married right away or the guy who's like, oh, I can't believe you're out with such a loser like me or whatever. Um, when that desperation comes across in dating, the first thing we want to do is shut down. Uh, we don't feel connected to that. We kind of wonder what's wrong with them maybe. And uh, we don't want to necessarily pursue it. I think the same thing is true in business. When we're trying a little too hard to book that wedding, when we kind of turn into what we say is, you know, Julia Roberts in my best friend, wed my best friend's wedding, pick me, choose me, let me make you happy. Um, it's it's very much a turnoff for clients. And so coming into your own space allows you to kind of bring across that confidence to do what we call the reverse sell. So there's hard sell, there's soft sell, which is I'm still going to sell to you, but it's going to be a little more like. Um, nuanced and not quite so obvious. And then there's the reverse cell. Um, the reverse cell is from uh, actually from the office. Michael Scott, any office fans out there? Um, and uh, they're kind of like watching this guy, the salesman who's taking all their jobs. They're kind of like doing the surveillance on him. And Meredith comes in as the pretend client and she's trying to buy from him. And the guy says, Hold on, let's just get to know each other. And Michael goes, Oh, he's doing the reverse cell. That's kind of a practice that we've put into place in our business, which is 
we flipped this idea. If 95 or 97 or 99 percent of photographers are over here fighting with each other and competing over booking that one client, what if we took that mentality, this big pick me, choose me, let me make you happy mentality, and flipped it on, on its head? If we only want to take 20 or 25 weddings, if we only have 20 or 25 golden tickets, what if we kind of sat back and where we used to be in the interviewee chair, you know, the hot seat answering the tough questions, what if we asked them some questions like, hey, what are you guys looking for in your photography? Or what are you guys looking for to most for the day? What do you like to do for fun with each other? How did you guys, you know, get engaged? Tell us that story. And we kind of like played it in that very confident, cool place. Um, then it goes back to that scarcity thing we were talking about before where we're not fighting for it so hard and they're actually drawn in. Um, again, I want to really drive home that idea that we were doing the reverse sell before we had bookings pouring in. And I truly believe because we were able to kind of pull that inner confidence out, which is so tough to do when you just need to get the bookings, I get it, I totally get it, but just really like pulling out that confidence and that um, faith in ourselves, it pulls the clients to you in a way that um, trying too hard never will. And when we think about it that way, I think it makes a lot of sense. Good. Finally, our last tip of the 10 is to just get um, a la carte pricing a try. There are definitely a ton of pricing theories and models out there, the two biggest ones being a la carte and packages. Um, when we first started with our businesses, we with our business we had packages for sure. Um, and in about 2008, we did a mentoring session with Jim Kennedy out in California who does uh, 300 weddings a year, 90 himself the rest in um, associate photographers. And he was the first one to really say to us the kind of power of a la carte pricing and giving people an entry point that they can wrap their heads around. So it's a very quick example. When we were packages in Connecticut, please don't get too caught up in the numbers. It really depends on the market and the timing of things and where you are in your business. Um, at the time, we were six packages starting at 6,000 in Connecticut, which is a very um, elevated market. And after the mentoring session, we just basically took all the product out of that 6,000 and came down to 4,500, just coverage, just entry point. We thought what would happen is that we would be able to get more people in the door at that number um, and, you know, maybe make a little bit less per wedding, but be able to make a lot more overall because we were able to book more weddings. Here's what happened for us um, in our business um, consistently since 2008 is that when we switched to a la carte and we had that lower entry point, just the shift from 6,000 to 4,500 was the difference between are you absolutely crazy to Whew, that's more than I was thinking of spending but I can at least wrap my head around it, right? It's within the realm of possibility. And so we got more people in the door. Great. Very surprising and unexpectedly to us though was not only were we getting them in the door, not only were we booking 90 to 95% of them, Almost all of them, once they had made the choice to go ahead and book us, fell into this kind of may as well mentality. Well, if we're going to hire you, we may as well add on the images. We may as well add on an album. We may as well add on a few extra hours of coverage. And so not only were people booking us, getting in the door of booking us, but they were actually, by the time they were done, of their own volition, building packages that were as big or bigger as when we had set packages. So now we were doing about four times the wedding at the same price, and we hit this really great place of momentum and just kind of steamrolling in our business where we could really use that money to feed into growth in all the other areas. Good. So finally, and my last tip to kind of go along with that is um, if you're kind of reaching a point, like have some good booking goals for each month. Say in uh, July, we want to book three weddings. In August, we want to book two weddings. In September, we want to bounce back up to three and keep track of those. And if you're hitting a point where you feel like you're not going to hit your booking goals, don't be afraid to run some booking specials. I think booking specials should have two things value and immediacy value and immediacy and so what we'll try to do is not lower the price but add on something of value in that a la carte pricing sheet we put a five hundred dollar price on our engagement sheet and so when we're doing a booking special that's a great thing that we can add in that we would want to do anyway that's a big key we would want to do anyway but to our clients it's something of five hundred dollar value we found five hundred to be kind of that sweet spot number of it feels like a significant value and then we run those booking specials for not a month at a time, but two weeks at a time. And so they have that kind of that pending deadline of immediacy. And every time we run a booking special, we're able to bump up those um, bookings for the month. Good. And then closing the sale for us um, is basically just at the end of that meeting where we're hanging out and we're kind of getting to know them uh, with that reverse sell, asking them questions about themselves. 
our hope is that we'll spend about two hours getting to know them. And at the end, we just really like to tag out of the room, to tag out of the situation. So we've been drinking a lot of wine and mimosas at that point. We'll just tag into the kitchen to make some tea or coffee. And just that element of being completely not hard sell or soft sell, but almost reverse sell of being totally out of the situation gives them the chance to say, I'm good. Are you good? Figure out what they want to add in, and then a lot of them will tend to book right on the spot.